In this video, I'm going to do an example solution to a titration lab, but it's one which involves the use of a redox reaction. So there will be oxidation reduction concepts used because the actual reaction that happens during the titration is a redox reaction. So in an attempt to determine the concentration of a hydrogen peroxide solution, a student titrated a sample of the peroxide solution with an acidified potassium dichromate solution. And then we were given the data. So we know the concentration of the dichromate, and we know, of course, the volume of both the dichromate and the hydrogen peroxide. So we know in this case the sample was the hydrogen peroxide. We're used to using 10 mil samples, but this case uses 12.6 mils, doesn't matter. We'll be able to use that information in our stoichiometry calculations. And normally with this information, we can go ahead with a balanced equation and calculate the unknown, which in this case is the concentration of hydrogen peroxide. But in order to do that, we always need to start with a balanced chemical equation. Normally, a balanced chemical equation was easy enough for us to set up because it would be maybe a single replacement, maybe a double replacement, maybe a neutralization reaction. In this case, it's not looking quite so simple. We are not going to know exactly how to react our hydrogen peroxide with di potassium dichromate solution. Right In this case, hydrogen peroxide is not an ionic bond that we could just use a double replacement with this ionic bond of the potassium dichromate solution. So we have to ask ourselves the question, what exactly is happening here? What reaction is going to take place? And from a redox perspective, we know how to predict what reaction will take place. We have a method, we have steps that will help us to determine that. So we're gonna follow those steps to basically figure out our reaction first, and then we're gonna do normal stoichiometry with it. So to determine the reaction that takes place, we generally start with listing all the species that we have present. And we're gonna ask ourselves, well, what of those species will react together? So let's just start with listing them. We have a, obviously we have hydrogen peroxide present. We're told that the hydrogen peroxide is some concentration in solution, which means it has to be dissolved in water. So there has to also be water present. We're also told we have an acidified potassium dichromate solution. So acidified is going to mean there's H plus ions in solution. Potassium dichromate is an ionic bond, so we can dissociate that and show that we have potassium, which exists as K plus with the dichromate polyatomic ion, which is Cr2O72 minus. Again, it's a solution, but we've already listed water as being present, so it seems like these are all the species present in our reaction container, so in the flask where this titration is actually producing a reaction. Now, of all these species, we want to identify the ones that are going to react, and we know from redox that it's going to be the strongest oxidizing agent and the strongest reducing agent which, which will react. So let's identify all the oxidizing and reducing agents and choose the strongest ones. So you'll find hydrogen peroxide listed as a reducing agent. Water we know can be either a reducing agent or an oxidizing agent. H plus likes to be an oxidizing agent. K plus also exists as an oxidizing agent. And the dichromate anion does nothing by itself, but when it's together with acid, with H+, we know that it also likes to be an oxidizing agent. So once we've identified all the possibilities, we have to come up with the strongest oxidizing and the strongest reducing agent. So going, looking at our table from the top left, we're going to find the acidified dichromate as our strongest oxidizing agent, and we're going to find hydrogen peroxide as our strongest reducing agent. And as a quick double check, in the context of this problem, that makes perfect sense. We want our hydrogen peroxide to react, and we want our dichromate solution to react. And if the acid didn't react, well, then why would we have acidified it? Right? So it makes sense with the situation that we have acidified dichromate reacting with hydrogen peroxide. So our next step to predicting the reaction that will occur is to basically write those two half reactions down. So the reduction half reaction is going to be our dichromate reacting with the acid. And these reactions, these half reactions, we can take directly from our data booklet. 
So we'll just copy them down. We have our Cr2072 minus reacting with 14 hydrogen ions and gaining six electrons produces two Cr3 plus ions along with seven waters. For the oxidation half reaction, we're going to do the same thing and just copy down the reaction of hydrogen peroxide. Now, of course, copy the reverse direction one because it's happening in the reverse direction when our hydrogen peroxide is what is, I guess, in a way decomposing to produce oxygen gas and hydrogen ions and giving off two electrons in that process. Now, when we combine these oxidation and reduction reactions, we have to ensure that the number of electrons transferred is constant, or the number of electrons gained and lost by each half reaction is the same, which it's not right now. We see our reduction reaction scooping up six electrons and our oxidation reaction only giving off two, which means our whole oxidation reaction is going to have to be multiplied by three so that we get a total of six electrons out of it. And now we can go ahead and combine and write our resultant reaction, our net reaction, as being what we expect to actually happen in our flask where this reaction is occurring. So we have our Cr2O7 anion reacting with our H pluses. I'm just going to notice a second that we have H pluses on both sides of our final equation. So some of these 14 H pluses are going to cancel out with some of these two times three H pluses, so six. If we do 14 minus six, that gives us eight left over on the left-hand side of our equation. We also need to include our hydrogen peroxide on the left side of our equation. And our electrons, of course, should balance. There should be six on both sides, so they will cancel out. And we have left on the right-hand side, we have two of our chromium ions with seven waters still and three oxygen gases. So from here on, our work is exactly like it used to be in the good old days when we just did regular old stoichiometry. We only use redox for the fact that we will balance the equation with the loss and gain of electrons. Once we have our equation, the same stoichiometry applies. So let's consolidate our given information under the reaction equation. We were told that the concentration of potassium chromate was 0.05 moles per liter. So the concentration of just the dichromate anion will be the same thing. And we were also told that we have 27.3 mils of that stuff. We also know we have 12.6 mils of hydrogen peroxide, and we are wondering the concentration of that. So just like we used to do, we'll take our 27.3 mils of the dichromate anion times by 0 0.0500 moles per liter in such a way that we'll be able to cancel out liters or milliliters. The mole ratio of our two, well, according to my equation, looks like one to one, but I forgot the three in front of the hydrogen peroxide, because of course it had to be times by the three. So it's actually three moles of hydrogen peroxide for every one mole of the dichromate. And by now, we have moles of hydrogen peroxide, so we should be able to put liters on the bottom and get our, all of our units to work out. So 12.6 mils of H2O2. Uh, I want to quickly point out that you may be thinking of putting the mils into liters right away, which would be perfectly fine. It actually does work this way as well. And I'll just cross out the units the way they cancel this way and show you how that works. So our volume of dichromate, well, we can actually cancel out the liters of dichromate with liters of dichromate. And we actually keep the milli there. We cancel out moles of dichromate with moles of dichromate. We cancel out moles of hydrogen peroxide. Uh, sorry, those moles don't get canceled out. We now have milli on the top. So we actually technically have millimoles of hydrogen peroxide per milliliter of hydrogen peroxide, but a millimole per milliliter, we can just cancel out those two millis and we get moles per liter. It's kind of a shortcut way, and you don't have to do this. You're certainly welcome to write your units as liters and do your conversions along the way. But now I'm just going to remove all those kind of messy annotations now. We know they cancel out our final 
units should now be moles per liter of hydrogen peroxide. So if you punch that out, you should get 0 0.325 moles per liter of hydrogen peroxide. And we have successfully answered the question that we were asked to find out the concentration, the unknown concentration in our titration.